I would like to call on stage Elizabeth Lodge. Liz Lodge, not only an avid blogger, I wanted to mention it, it was not in your bio, but she is. She's also the writing director of the Humanities Core course at the University of California. And she recently published a book called Virtual Politique. And I have to read the subtitle because it's quite long. Virtual Politique, an electronic history of government media making in a time of war, scandal, disaster, miscommunication, and mistakes. Liz Losch. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, thanks to the organizers. Uh, I'm glad to see everyone still here. Uh, my body thinks it's early in the morning in California and that I've stayed up all night, so uh, bear with me as I try to do exciting things like open files, which I'm having a little trouble with for some reason. Ah, here we go. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a montage of Obama on YouTube moments, starting in December 2006 with uh, one of the first three videos that was posted on the BarackObama.com site, um, and then take you through uh, about a week ago. Um, so these are some sort of highlights of Obama's YouTube performance, and then I'm going to sort of go through some slides and then look at uh, a little bit of sort of interview footage. So let's take a look at uh, Obama on YouTube. And I apologize for the um, resolution and the artifacts. I'm afraid these aren't artistic glitches like Rosa was talking about yesterday. So tonight, I'd like to put all the doubts to rest. I would like to announce to my hometown of Chicago and all of America that I am ready for the Bears to go all the way, baby. In 1982, Anwar Sadat traveled to Israel, a trip that resulted in a peace agreement that has lasted ever since. In the spirit, oops, sorry, spirit of that type of bold leadership, would you be willing to meet separately, without precondition, during the first year of your administration in Washington or anywhere else, with the leaders of Iran, Syria, Venezuela, Cuba, and North Korea, in order to bridge the gap that divides our countries? I should also point out that Stephen is in the crowd tonight, Senator Obama. I would. Uh, and the reason is this, that the notion that somehow not talking to countries uh, is punishment to them, uh, which has been the guiding uh, diplomatic principle of this administration, is ridiculous. Absolutely. So nice to see you. I thought YouTube did a terrific job. When the American people ask questions, you can tell that uh, they're paying attention to this race. And I thought it went uh, extraordinarily well. And it was, it was funnier than uh, most of the other debates, which is important as well. Hello, everybody. This is Barack Obama. I appreciate this opportunity to welcome you to the 2008 Alaska State Democratic Convention. Nací en una isla. Y entiendo que la comida, la gasolina, y todo cuesta más. North Carolina, this is Barack Obama, and I'm counting on you. Please log on to nc.barackobama.com. Today, the leaders of the G20 nations, a group that includes the world's largest economies, are gathering in Washington to seek solutions to the ongoing turmoil in our financial markets. We begin this year in this administration in the midst of an unprecedented crisis that calls for unprecedented action. Today I want to extend my very best wishes to all who are celebrating Nowruz around the world. This holiday is both an ancient ritual and a moment of renewal, and I hope that you enjoy this special time of year with friends and family. In particular, I would like to speak directly to the people and leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran. One of my priorities as President is opening up the White House to the American people so that folks can understand what we're up to and have a chance to participate themselves. I've also held town halls around the country to get perspectives from outside Washington, where people are feeling the brunt of this economic crisis, not as an abstract debate, but as an everyday reality. Many of you are worried and have a lot of questions, and you want to know what your government is doing to get our economy back on track. You deserve those answers. That's why we're going to try something a little different. 
We're going to take advantage of the Internet to bring all of you to the White House to talk about the economy. Here's the idea. Right now at WhiteHouse.gov, anyone can submit a question about the economy or vote on other questions. We're going to compile those questions and votes, and then on Thursday, I'll be giving you some answers myself. Uh, just to interrupt, uh, Jared, before you ask the next question, just to say that you know, we, uh, we, took, uh, we took votes about which questions were going to be asked. And I think 3 million people voted, or 3.5 million people voted. I have to say that there, there was one question that was voted on that, that ranked fairly high, uh, and that was whether legalizing marijuana would improve uh, the economy and job creation. And uh, uh, I don't know what this says about the online audience, but... <laughs> But I, I just want, uh, I don't want people to think that uh, this was a fairly popular question. We want to make sure that it was answered. Uh, the answer is no, I don't think that is a good strategy to grow our economy. So many of the questions that are put to you on the videos, Mr. President, are also very personal. So now we're going to take another from the video. Can people hear My me? mommy and daddy have small businesses and we need health care. I actually have to work for a company so that we can get coverage because my older daughter is in automatic decline and we're just too small of a business to be able to absorb the cost. How can um, health care reform help us? We have a small and I live more. <laughs> As somebody with two daughters, I'm a sucker for anybody who uses their daughter in their video, so uh, my staff probably knew that. They figured, well. He's going to be a soft touch after that one. Today I'd like to talk with you about a subject that I know is on everybody's mind, and that's the state of our economy. On behalf of the American people, including Muslim communities in all 50 states, I want to extend best wishes to Muslims in America and around the world. Ramadan Karim. As members of the Jewish faith here in America and around the world gather to celebrate the high holidays, I want to extend my warmest wishes for this new year. Hashanah Tova Tikka Table. On behalf of the American people, I want to extend my warmest wishes for Diwali to all who celebrate this auspicious holiday here in America and around the world. Thirty-three months ago, on the steps of the old state capitol in Springfield, Illinois, our movement for change began. And in the weeks and months that followed, in living rooms and backyards all across America, millions of you lent your voices to that movement. You volunteered, some of you for the very first time, others for the first time in a long time. I'd like to speak with you for a few minutes today about the tragedy that took place at Fort Hood. This past Thursday, on a clear Texas afternoon, an Army psychiatrist walked into the Soldier Readiness Processing Center and began shooting his fellow soldiers. So that brings us up to just last week. So let's take a look at sort of some of the themes that uh, we might see emerging when we look closely at these different YouTube performances. And I think what these performances seem to suggest, as Garrett Lovink was saying yesterday, is that the state is far from withering away when it comes to YouTube. That even though YouTube might be conventionally associated with a fragmented politics of personal liberty and rhizomatic modes of resistance, there are also many ways that YouTube um, reinstantiates uh, political institutions in their most traditional forms uh, as they're defined by national borders and systems of constitutional order. How do I make it display as a, as a slideshow? Ah. Oh, I see, down here. Okay. Okay, ah! All right. So in the first video Vortex Reader, uh, I wrote about the YouTube channels of the Department of Defense, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of State. And what I argued is that you could see in these channels uh, certain practices associated with surveillance, governmentality, the interpolation of the political subject, authentication, statistification, routinization, bureaucracy in the Weberian sense of the maintenance of files, 
and certain kinds of legalism. Um, however, there are also ways that this video that was put online by the Bush administration, uh, as Brian Willems was suggesting yesterday, um, has a certain unreadability that is fundamental to representing the exercise of state authority. So in this case, what we're looking at is a frame from a video that was released by the Transportation Security Administration. And it was supposed to explain an episode in which a woman who had a child in a stroller with a sippy cup claimed to have been harassed by TSA officers at an airport. Now when the video was released, it resisted the kinds of reading that the TSA thought that the general public would give it. Um, and in fact, many people read the, the video as being about a kind of ritual humiliation of the woman that was um, sort of doubly represented in this kind of uh, venue. So I'm interested in how the government actually uses technology not for utopian or dystopian purposes, but essentially to preserve the status quo, to sort of maintain existing structures of power, to neither sort of create a better democracy nor a worse one, but simply maintain the forces of democracy that we have. And in the Virtual Politik book, I argue that uh, online video, along with a variety of rhetorical um, platforms, uh, is used uh, in, to, in, in ways that can be described by four trends. And the trends are public diplomacy, which is the, uh, when governments attempt to speak directly to the people of another country rather than go through their official representatives. So public diplomacy is one. Another one is social marketing, which is an attempt to use the techniques and tools of the advertising industry in order to propagate messages about public health safe or public safety. A risk communication, which is designed to give um, citizens information about threat levels in ways that um, add credibility to existing um, structures of authority. And the fourth trend that I look at is um, institutional branding, which is the way that, that strategies of branding get applied to political institutions and our sort of conventional understandings of political power. So the virtual politic book is about the Bush administration, but obviously we have a new administration. And it's using online video in some different ways but also in ways that remind us of this tension that's built in between content creation and regulation when institutional bodies try to be media makers. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting about the Obama administration's use of online video is that they often use this video in a way that preserves face in the sort of sociolinguistic sense that Irving Goffman and, and Brown and Levinson talk about this sort of structure of the social self as a, as a, as a kind of legible um, and yet rule-based uh, structure. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, it's, a, it's a strategy that's been widely imitated. Now if you look closely at this page, which was the page uh, of the Obama victory site, and you notice the YouTube player in the bottom right corner. Now this is the page of, um, uh, of the uh, Israeli uh, Likud party that's using some of the same elements of the page visually and also using the YouTube player, except in, uh, in uh, the opposite of, instead of being left to right, right to left. Now many people would argue that it wasn't really hard for Obama to be successful with online video in comparison to his opponent. Uh, this is a McCain Space, which was an online uh, video sharing site that was supposed to attract young male supporters uh, and young female supporters who might be involved in the McCain campaign. Uh, it ultimately uh, mostly attracted people in their 40s and 50s who were not the intended demographic, uh, many of whom were from the Deep South, um, and who seemed to use it to sort of express um, 
feelings of loneliness and de desire to meet uh, like-minded others of the opposite sex. Um, so one of the things that I think is really interesting when you sort of look at the, the uh, way that Obama uses YouTube and sort of visualizes YouTube is the way that a lot of these images actually draw attention to the apparatus of filmmaking itself. And I call this um, mediated transparency, that there's a way that um, Obama consistently draws attention to the presence of lights, of cameras, of uh, viewfinders, of screens. And you'll see this when you look at his videos. Uh, instead of using a frame grab to represent the video, they will often use one of these shots that sort of draws attention to, as you can see, the lights here in this image. Now that's in contrast to McCain, who became sort of famous for his green screen footage, uh, where he'd appear in front of a green screen or sort of a similar uh, setup where he'd create a backdrop. Um, in this case, uh, what, he believe, what his staff believed was Walter Reed Hospital was actually a high school named after Walter Reed. And so he's speaking about Walter Reed Hospital right now, but actually not having a, a, a correlative that matches his subject matter. Famously, of course, this, some of his green screen footage was leaked to the Colbert Report. There was an online challenge for people to create humorous footage using this green screen uh, imagery from McCain. Um, and in fact, people subsequently created these images without there being green screen. So in the, the case of this image after the debates, uh, people actually digitally removed the existing background and then sort of created a green screen after the fact. So this is another example of the kind of rhetoric of uh, mediated transparency. But I think one of the things that's important to remember, as Lev Manovich uh, points out in the language of new media, is a screen both displays and filters out. It screens and screens out. But that to some degree, Americans accept the idea of a mediated presidency. We have a long history of thinking about uh, technologies of representation and presidential authority. So what you're looking at here, are these are stereoscopic photographs from uh, the 1860, uh, 1861 inauguration of Abraham Lincoln. The Capitol Dome is not finished at this point, and this is shortly before the Civil War. And these stereoscopic photographs were very popular as a way to sort of understand important public events involving the office of the presidency. Now, one of the things that, when you look at these YouTube performances, is when they were first released, there was the analogy made to the fireside chats of FDR, the sort of pose of the pedagogical president. And you'll see that in a lot of the Obama videos that you looked at, he's, he's explaining economic conditions to the American people. He's, he's, he's put in the role of the explicator. He's put in the role of the sort of pedagogical agent, explaining conditions of kind of macroeconomics or geopolitics that might be outside the understanding of the typical citizen. And in fact, uh, Obama still does radio addresses that explicitly call upon some of the rhetorical strategies of FDR. But I think it's important when you look at the photo documentation of the fireside chats is to see just how mediated they were through radio. The ways in which the sort of apparatus of communications technologies were sort of really made visible to the American people. So often when you ask Americans, about the visual culture of the fireside chat, they imagine FDR sort of standing next to a fireside or sitting next to a fireside since he couldn't stand, um, sort of speaking comfortingly to the American people. But the actual visual culture of the period really drew attention to the, the political spectacle and the way that it was sort of mediated by communication technologies. So I'd say that this sort of phenomena that we're seeing with Obama actually isn't that new, even though it's new media. I also think it's interesting to see the ways that um, Obama is acknowledging 
the, the fact that there's a non-English internet, as he speaks to people in their own languages, as he sort of makes that public diplomacy move. And that's, again, something that kind of came up the first day in Gert Loving's introduction when he talked about the sort of uh, ways that sort of English uh, hegemonic control over the internet is, has waned in many ways. Of course, the, the iconic moment for Kennedy was his grammatically uh, not fortuitous uh, Ich bin ein Berliner speech. Um, but it's an interesting thing that, that Obama has these sort of moments where he's speaking in languages other than English and trying to sort of use YouTube as a way to address non-English speaking audiences or at least make the gesture of the non-English speaking internet. And this is particularly true in his sort of uh, overtures to the Middle East. Um, Obama, as we also saw in the montage, plays the role of the patriarch, uh, consoling the nation in times of national tragedy, as we see Ronald Reagan here uh, doing so uh, after the Challenger disaster. Um, he also borrows, oops, um, and we also saw George Bush use online video on the White House website for the same purpose after the September 11th attacks. Many people forget that Bush was an, uh, an active user of online video on his site. Um, uh, Obama also bor borrows another technique uh, from Ronald Reagan, which is calling out uh, members of the audience as a sort of personal exemplar of a kind of complicated series of uh, of economic, social, or political factors. Um, in this case, um, this is from the fifth inaugural when Ronald Reagan calls out to young Tyrone Ford, who you can see in the front here, who is a gifted gospel singer, uh, in order to, to make his point about the sort of American character. And each one of these children was referred to by name and their exceptional accomplishments as sort of exemplary Americans was part of the speech. And we see the same technique being used by Bill Clinton, but retasked in the environment of the town hall meeting. And I think that sort of thinking about the ways that the town hall has a sort of rhetorical function uh, can be interesting to look at as well. I mean, uh, if you know Bruno Latour's uh, collection of, uh, edited collection of essays and artwork that uh, was in uh, uh, Making Things Public, uh, he comes back to the, um, the Palazzo Publico in Siena and the uh, mural with the allegory of good and bad government several times. Um, however, I'm kind of more interested in thinking about uh, the historian Titler's uh, reading of the town hall. I mean, he's interested in how um, town halls were architecturally important for political legitimacy and effective rule. And Titler says, the structure, furnishings, use, and mystique of the architecture of the town hall was central to governance. So I think there are ways that the sort of political spectacle of the town hall serves as a kind of uh, architecture of control that's interesting to look at. And as we see Obama sort of in this kind of augmented reality environment where he can, he can use screens to call up uh, remote citizens on their webcams, even though it's asynchronous communication, uh, draws on a kind of idea of a political spectacle of pseudo-participation um, that's very uh, different and yet related to the town hall movements of the United States in the 1930s, 40s, and up to the 50s. This is a Detroit town hall meeting in 1951. Uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there was a strong movement toward having these town hall meetings in major American cities because the feeling was that urban government had gotten sort of too large and unwieldy for direct democracy. And so there needed to be a kind of ritual um, reimagining of direct democracy, a sort of theater of direct democracy. And uh, so you can see sort of one of these theaters here uh, in taking place in Detroit. The other thing about the town hall, though, is it's, it was a mass media phenomenon. If you look at uh, the town hall movement uh, that be began the America's Town Hall Meeting of the Air in 1935, which was a radio broadcast that included many of the elements of the sort of modern day town hall. There were remote callers, there were questions fielded from the audience, there was sort of a mix of live and remote, uh, asynchronous and synchronous communication. Um, and there would be a bell ringer at the beginning of each show, and he would yell, 
a which way America, fascism, socialism, communism, or democracy? So, um, in several of the talks so far today, there's been, we've been talking about um, property relations and how looking at the uh, backgrounds of YouTube video, uh, videos give us information about consumer culture and about the domestic space. Um, and I think that it's useful to also think about how some feminist critics of interior design have looked at sort of the way these spaces are gendered. I actually picked a, um, uh, two frames from the blog uh, Obscene Interiors. Does anyone know that blog? It's a blog that has, uh, they take the, the figures in pornographic images out. So you can just look closely at the actual uh, sort of material culture in which the pornography takes place. Um, a similar technique gets used by, uh, by those who are uh, uh, internet spoilers who are looking for potential hoaxes and evidence of stagecraft. So, for example, the Lonely Girl 15 uh, case was exposed by people who were fascinated with how her bedroom looked like a staged environment rather than a sort of authentic bedroom. So I kind of like to do the same thing with Obama that the, that the obscene interiors guy does. I like to actually take Obama out of the frame and just look at the lamps the flags, the books, look at the sort of ways that the sort of domesticity of the White House is represented, how we understand this space that is both private and public, and how we see this as a sort of staging ground for YouTube rhetoric. Now, there are ways, of course, that this has a, a rhetorical history as well. Uh, in the Kennedy administration, the space of the White House became very important for establishing the credibility of Kennedy, uh, who created a, a lot of anxiety for Americans because he was the first Catholic president in a country that was sort of dominated by the Protestant ethic and all of its ideologies. Um, you could argue that Obama has to do much of the same thing that Kennedy did. He has to establish the fact that he's not a Muslim sympathizer, transnational cosmopolitan, but really he's a true uh, American who has this very typical domestic life. And we see uh, this is the arrival of the puppy, uh, Bo, who had been promised at Obama's victory speech into the White House. This, however, is not Bo. This is Barney, George Bush's dog, who was a popular character on George Bush's online videos that were on the White House website for the holiday season, and that certain activists and wags enjoyed remixing in various comical ways. Uh, Barney would appear with people like Karl Rove and uh, other, other certain nefarious characters of the Bush administration. So one question might be, how much change do we really have? There's a tendency to sort of want to think about the Bush administration and its relationship with computational media, which was certainly a difficult one, and think about Obama on the campaign trail and the way that he was sort of represented uh, as a pulse taker, as someone who was using computational media to constantly check, channel check with the voters. However, this Obama is long gone. You won't see Obama interacting with a screen anywhere on any of the thousands of official photos on the White House website. Instead, you see he's totally disconnected from the screen, right? He's playing football. He's interacting with everything but the screen. On the rare occasions where we see him at a screen, it explains, of course, that he's at his secretary's desk outside the Oval Office. And we see from his body language that he's uncomfortable looking at the computer. Because, of course, the computer, as we learn from YouTube, is really a, about women's work in the White House. It's really about women's relationship with the screen. The other, of course, suppressed part of Obama's uh, sort of identity as a computer user is his use of ubiquitous computing technology. Uh, does anybody know what he's holding in his hand there? This is the one photo I could find of it. And I, I looked through hundreds, if not thousands, of photos. 
It's his official, top secret, specially encoded and encrypted White House Blackberry. This is the only picture you can find, uh, or at least I could find. If you can find some better ones, I'd be interested. Uh, I think it's sort of like uh, his smoking, his cigarette pack. It's this kind of uh, forbidden thing to be represented uh, in the visual culture of the White House. Instead, what we see are hundreds of photographs of him tethered to a traditional telephone, sort of in the pose of Cold War brinksmanship. And in fact, we get strong messages from the visual culture of the White House that the Blackberries are to be checked outside, that to be presidential is not to be wired. And in fact, I'd argue, you know, kind of following Tarleton Gillespie, that we see Obama as a kind of ideal computer user who isn't a computer user, and that that's sort of this strange paradoxical ideal that the visual culture of the White House is sending. To be the right kind of computer user is to not use a computer at all. There are two other interesting aspects of Obama's use of YouTube. One uh, is he, he used the, the public diplomacy method of address, addressing populations directly with school children, um, quite controversially in the United States. Uh, many uh, right-wing parents wanted to keep their children home uh, the day that Obama gave his uh, address to school children uh, because there was uh, anxiety about state propaganda uh, reaching directly into the minds of impressionable young children. Of course, even though YouTube's, uh, the YouTube channel's uh, message to children uh, received over 700,000 hits, there's one problem. Most schools in the K-12 environment in the United States block YouTube, even for logical, pedagogical reasons, because there's so much anxiety about either children accessing inappropriate content during school hours on school property, and possible liability or uh, winking at a culture of leisure when really school is about an environment for work. So actually, um, in order to be able to watch the video, uh, uh, teachers were faced with all sorts of technical problems because unless they had cable television, they could no longer pull the signal out of the air they couldn't watch it on YouTube, so they, did it, they were able to watch it live streaming on CNN, but they, they had a sort of a limited number of options. The other important thing about YouTube, of course, is the way that it compromises the privacy of citizens. That those who visit uh, whitehouse.gov um, are subject to uh, YouTube's cookie implantation and that they are being surveilled and data is being collected from them uh, in ways that they are not conscious of. And that there are ways that the social contract itself is being rewritten by this large uh, Google-owned company. Um, this has been something that was first publicized by Christopher Zagoyan, uh, the blogger who uh, we sort of started this talk with airport security. He sort of first became known as under the Bush administration as as part of the no ID movement, as someone who didn't believe in the security theater that was being presented by the TSA. But later, he sort of came to be a critic of the privacy aspects of YouTube. He noticed the fact that the White House attempted to use different kinds of players, but would invariably go back to YouTube. And I noticed that this week, they're trying a different kind of player again. So it'll be interesting to see if they stick with it or if they just go back to YouTube. Because, of course, Obama has a very close relationship with Eric Schmidt, CEO of YouTube, um, even though it's a sort of large monopolistic conglomerate. So I'd like to show, just in closing, a little bit of an interview with Christopher Segoyan talking about um, the problems with YouTube. And this is a project, by the way, that uh, includes, we've been talking some about Henry Jenkins and the sort of model of participatory culture. Uh, he's part of this project of interviews. Ah. To be cut off. And, uh, but I also present a lot of, of, of opinions that are contrary to the participatory culture equals democracy model that Jenkins is sort of offering us uncritically. Um, so for example, one of the people who's part of this project is Siva Vadyanathan as well. Google's stated mission is to organize ah, the world. Wait, I'm trying to get to Christopher Zagoyan, sorry. 
there are too many videos to show, so let me just show this one. Uh, this January, I think within a day or two of the administration's uh, arrival to the White House, I started to highlight some of the problems associated with the president's use of YouTube. The fact that these videos were being embedded directly into the White House uh, website and the fact that YouTube was being given just so much data on, on persons. Um, there had been a specific uh, cutout uh, from strict federal privacy rules uh, that exempted YouTube's collection of data from the White House website. And, and so I, I tried to draw attention to this. And in the days that followed, the White House actually did uh, respond quite rapidly, initially rolling out some, some quick changes so that people were not given uh, what are called cookies uh, by YouTube's servers when they first visit the White House page. Um, the language in the White House privacy policy that specifically excluded YouTube from the uh, privacy rules was softened, I, I guess you could say, to include other companies. Now it just says third-party video sharing sites, uh, which could be seen as making it worse. I mean, uh, you know, the, the initial claim by, by my colleagues and I was that this was a cushy deal between the White House and YouTube. And so by expanding it to other companies, you know, perhaps it's less of a cushy deal. Um, but, you know, the fact is, it, uh, is that these rules still are being either bent or, or just wholesale, wholesale uh, thrown out the window uh, so that YouTube can continue to provide these services for free uh, to the administration. Over the past few months, since then, there have been several other uh, developments. Uh, for a week or two, the White House even toyed with uh, a non-YouTube uh, video delivery mechanism, but they quickly reverted. Uh, and now it seems like the federal government is collecting the views of those in the privacy and, and data mining communities to find out whether the government should be prohibited anymore from the kind of data collection practices that YouTube is using in the first place. Um, so things are developing slowly. Um, you know, it, it's not particularly great news on the privacy front, uh, primarily because of the fact that this company and, and companies like YouTube are just collecting so much data. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, the, you know, the, the allure of those millions of eyeballs is too much for anyone uh, in the White House to say no to. You know, I don't think that they're going out of their way to be bad on privacy. It's just that you know, these are the terms that YouTube is willing to do business on. And the White House is just not able to say no to the, to the reach that YouTube provides. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Liz Lars. Um, could you tell us a bit more about this website? Because I'm sure that people might want to okay, watch well, this, some videos. Okay, well, this is a website in development. So I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to, as you can tell from the green screen and the sort of, uh, uh, sort of, uh, X-ray design of it. It's it's a sandbox area that I'm using now, um, but you can sort of see that uh, the idea is that I start with Henry Jenkins, um, and that he's sort of a, a the kind of opening level of criticism, and his interview is mostly about issues of access, and um, I'm talking about values in government that go beyond access that. You know, I'm asking, is access enough? Um, and so other people are talking about values like transparency, about values like fairness, about values like accountability, about values like privacy. Um, and so I try to kind of open up a kind of range of critiques. So for example, if you look at the skeptic level, wait a minute. When Obama, in his public addresses, makes statements like, kids, you need to stop playing Wait, sorry, Game Boy and get back. that's the wrong one. Unfortunately, it keeps moving as far as what but order Henry Jenkins is. talks about uh, fan communities as a model for the potential of broad civic participation. Uh, it reminds me a bit of uh, James G's commentary about the potential of educational video games. 
they're both talking about potentials. They're saying someone could come along and take these models of, here's a good video game, and we can imagine using that for learning. This is what G says, or Jenkins comes along and says, well, we have these enormous fan communities of extremely deep and complex participation. We can imagine them becoming models for civic participation. It doesn't seem far-fetched. The, the question is how and why would we believe that those things are going to happen? Just because something might become a model for something else, uh, doesn't make it a foregone conclusion that it will. And I suspect that the average citizen uh, is going to find that they would much rather use their time uh, to uh, write Harry Potter uh, fan fiction or to uh, play the latest uh, Call of Duty uh, rather than shift that focus into uh, civic action. So what we would need in order for these claims to uh, be more credible to me are examples where it really is taking place at the same level uh, as the kind of engagement that we see in fan communities or, or again, kind of bringing G into the conversation in, uh, in educational video games. And then, uh, then when you get to the, the next level up, the next level up is about uh, how could uh, government use computational media to affect real change. So my basic argument in the other two levels, the watchdog level and the skeptic level, is that uh, Often, government uses technology to preserve the status quo rather than to change it. So these are interviews about things like electronic voting, um, about uh, how uh, electronic voting could be used for, uh, to support other kinds of voting schemes, um, how uh, computational media could be used for redistricting. And then the final layer is, uh, level is about uh, preserving the digital record. It's the question of what happens when we created this public record it's hosted so on in the YouTube. American uh, voting system, uh, it's... Uh, we've created this public record that uh, isn't necessarily permanent. And so it's looking at the question of the kind of ephemerality of this digital record and who's going to preserve it and how. Yeah. Thanks. Any uh, other questions? I really liked uh, the historical perspective you uh, gave on this, but um, maybe you can also elaborate a bit on the, uh, uh, the differences uh, in the way that the Obama uh, administration is implementing this, these forms of communication. Uh, for instance, uh, if you compare it to the Bush administration, I mean, um, you could... Um, sort of disagree uh, in the, uh, uh, the way it's like um, authentic, but at least they are trying to be a bit more uh, communicative. Uh, it's more two-way, I guess. Uh, um, but you, what's your, what's your uh, view on, on that? But, I mean, but how two-way two really is it? I mean, is it kind of, uh, is it using uh, social media to create uh, pseudo participation, or does it really create real participation? Uh, so I'm sort of asking how the media mechanism is is being used to actually constrain political speech rather than to enable political speech. And I think that there are some ways. I mean, I'm certainly no fan of the Bush administration uh, since it got us involved in two disastrous wars and, you know, an economic catastrophe. Um, but uh, I, I do think that it's important to look critically at the Obama administration, um, even though, I mean, it's interesting that Christopher Zagoyan actually is now working for the U.S. government uh, for a .gov related site, um, and that th they are recruiting some privacy advocates um, for uh, working uh, in computational media and distributed networks uh, for U.S. government uh, citizen uh, participation. But there are also ways that um, the Obama administration has a very close relationship with a corporate monopoly. And uh, that was not something that uh, uh, existed in the same way uh, in, uh, in the Bush administration. Uh, there were other kinds of monopolies that had relationships with in relationship to the war, um, but but we didn't see the same kinds of, of of sort of uncritical relationship to questions, particularly the question of open search, which is important in terms of uh, you know critical internet studies. Thanks a lot. 
I'm afraid we have to round up because uh, we have some questions or some time for questions later, actually. Thank you very much, Liz.